So today I have the lovely pleasure of having my friend Colt here to tell us about their perspectives on Trans Day of Visibility and what the day means to them and we'll get to know a little bit about them in the process. Could you tell us a little bit about like who you are, some identities you hold, anything that you think viewers should know about you to get a sense of who you are? Sure. Thank you, future Dr. Chloe. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, so my name is Colt Sanamon. My pronouns are he and they. Um, I guess professionally, I'm a professional trans. And so what that means to me is I'm a licensed psychologist as well as a medical doctor um, who specializes in taking good care of people's gender health and sexual health as well, um, people of all ages. So I'm a gender nerd. And yeah, I'm a both and so a person who's part of our community, but also who serves our community in kind of a health service industry, if you will. So in terms of identities, so I guess we'll start there within gender. Um, identify if if it's just a like a quick hello, it's trans man, and that's just fine. But if people speak gender or can go to gender 501 courses with me, then it's lesbian man dyke, transgender queer two words. Um, and the, the first one, sexuality, and the second one, transgender queer, putting trans and then gender queer together because I identify as both binary and non-binary at the same time. Both and is one of my kind of core identities. So I'm a psychologist and I'm a medical doctor. I'm binary and I'm non-binary. I am Catholic and I'm trans. So a lot of combinations that people don't think go together are just part of who I am. So yeah, so being a both and is important. Um, I am a daddy to Phoenix, who is my puppy, who may be jumping on me anytime. Um, and what else? I am um, a partner. So I have a partner. Their name is Sean. They pronouns. And yeah, that's that's a lot about me. Thanks for sharing. Just, I was wondering, could you explain like how you found out that you identified both within and, you know, beyond the gender binary? Like, how did you kind of discover that aspect of your identity? Sure. Well, the kids call me a trandpa. I'm only 37, but I've been around, yeah. you know, a long time in trans years, if you will. And I was always very clear that I'm not a girl. Beyond that, the lifelong identity development process. I, I, that's for me, it is at least. Um, so I don't know, I've just always known very clearly that I wasn't a girl, but the idea of being just a boy or wanting to be a cisgender man didn't fit. Um, I want to be who I am, not something that I'm not. And so I felt like moving out of one expected identity into another box, didn't feel authentic to me. Um, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I learned that kind of this kind of holding two things together like this is actually part of me being two spirit. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize I was two spirit until I met another two spirit person who heard the way I talked about myself and Kelly is their name. And they are now my two spirit mentor, mentoring me into what we call two spirit medicine. Um, so that I can be even more helpful to our community. And so when they heard the way that I was talking about things that most people would be like, well, you got to be one or the other. Like, you can't just be that. And I was like, well, actually, I think I got one foot over here and one foot over here. And I think I am. So I am. And they were like, that's actually very kind of holding two worlds at once. It's very two-spirit philosophy. Do you have any Native heritage? And I was like, well, my parents always said I did, but it's so, you know, small that I never thought about it. They're like, nope. You're too spirit and I'm going to train you. And I was like, ah, cool. That's kind of exciting. Just right? kind of on accident, it sounds like finding this term and this identity that like fits just who you are rather than trying to force yourself into an identity. You find one that fits for you. I love that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think for me, it's just in the end, like transition is always for me about authenticity um, because it's so easy to fall back into other people's ideas of what we should be or do. Because I think for me, as a kid growing up and going to Catholic schools and living in like rural Texas, like it was protective for me to figure out the expectations and then just to put those on and do those. And so when I was transitioning, it was very tempting. People let me 
like for whatever reason, people were very clear with me about their expectations. If I'm going to be a guy, this is how I should do it. And like there was, it was very tempting to just do that because that's what I knew. But I was like, no, if I am going to do this, it's going to be about authenticity. It's not going to be about somebody else's idea of who or what I should be or who or what I should like. Oh, I feel like for a lot of us in the community, we, I like the point of touching on authenticity. We're all, a lot of us are trying to show up in the world as whoever we are. And society often tries to stifle that as much as it can. And, you know, part of that process may involve like choosing to be visible or some of us have no choice in being visible based on how we look or how we show up in the world. So I'm wondering, you know, in honor of Trans Day of Visibility, what what does this day mean to you? What does the kind of idea of visibility mean to you? If it's okay, if I can talk about the significance of the day. Yeah, of course. What it means. So for me, the first ever community event I ever showed up to that wasn't like a support group, but that was like a trans holiday um, or, a, you know, memorial is really what it is, right, is the Day of Remembrance, so Trans Day of Remembrance. And I had no preparation. No one told me, like, what to expect. Um, and the way that Houston did it back then, um, so it was probably 2007, was my first uh, T-Door, Transgender Day of Remembrance. Like, it was very much like people came and gave like a lot of their trauma stories. Um, and then they would name our dead, say how they were murdered, give gruesome details, and then like ring this bell. And I was just like, ooh, whoa, I, you know, this is my first time to be around this many trans people. It was a really sacred, a special experience in terms of how I was like, oh, yeah, that person's probably trans and that person's trans and like, I'm not the only one. And then it was just like, ooh, this really very traumatic experience of just kind of holding the being so exciting, excited to be me, find my community, and then also the realities that our black and brown um, trans siblings, especially sisters, you know, go through. and. So it's just like this, whoa. And I think for me, it scared me for a while and it got me in my head. And so, and like having that be our only shared holiday at the time was, you know, what I knew of as a trans person. And I was like, oh. So when the Trans Day of Visibility came about, it was like, we need a nice holiday. <laughs> like we want something that celebrates us while we're still here. Um, so that when we name ourselves and when we show up, you know, we're still, we're still here and we're visible and we celebrate that. And we also, we don't forget about our T-Door because T-Door a lot of times is the cost of being visible for many of us, right? And so we really hold, you know, the sacredness and the power of being visible. Well, I hold it very dear. And so for me, whenever that holiday came around, and I'm sorry, I don't know who coined it or whatnot, but I'm grateful. Um, it was just like a nice balance, if you will, to the heaviness um, that we have on T door every year, um, and it was it was just a, a breath of fresh air, and also it was kind of a check of privilege that not all of us can afford to be visible. And for me, it costs much less um, to be visible as somebody who is white, as somebody who is very much perceived to be binary or a cisgender, non-intersex, aka endosex male. Um, and so for me, my visibility doesn't cost as much. And so that's why I try to be more visible, um, every, every chance that, that I get. Um, and hopefully that can make more room for more of us as well. Absolutely. And what, what is, uh, being visible look like for you? I mean, I know you've talked about like all the work that you do in the community, but I'm wondering like on a day to day, like how does being visible show up for you? Sure. So. It's really interesting because there was there's not a lot about me that has changed through transition. And again, I transitioned over a decade ago, but I like wear the same clothes. Like I've liked boys clothes. I'm one of those like very old, like the old transcript stories of I've always known, blah, blah, blah. I always like boy things, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, and so the clothes that I wear didn't really change. Um, I just didn't have to wear a bra anymore. That was awesome. Um, and I think really starting hormones was when I became more visible. And I think it's really interesting because I do feel not as visible right now because people can't necessarily see my transness. 
um, from just looking at me. And so I, I do mourn a piece of that because I'd like to be more visible, but we didn't have any options, right, of showing up in a non, um, in, a, in a space where people could read my transness. I, it was very like, you should look like a queer kind of lesbian butch person or you should look like a dude and there wasn't a lot of space in between. So I didn't really have that option to process that. And I do wonder these days, like what I have done, what we now see folks doing being on testosterone just for a little while. And then when I had my voice lower or the hair that I wanted, would I have stopped? Oof. I don't know. Um, I love my beard and I love the way I look and sound. And so I think it was right for me to do what I did. Right. And so Right now for me showing up is just waking up in the morning because I think in terms of transition wise, I've arrived, if you will, in most ways in being comfortable with my physical embodiment, um, with my hair, um, with my voice, with the way I dress, um, with people's use of pronouns for me. I feel like that is all very authentic and that's very visible. So I try to be extra visible by coming out anywhere I feel safe enough to, to do so. That was a long tangential answer. I hope it talked about no. most of the things. That was perfect. <laughs> no. uh, there, there is no right or wrong answer. There's just whatever answer that feels right. <laughs> so, yeah. And earlier you talked about this, this idea of, um, you know, visibility can be very costly for a lot of people in the community in various ways, um, whether it's, you know, physical safety, you know, mental well-being, financial security, whatever it may be. So I'm wondering if you have any, like, words of support, affirmation, encouragement, anything for people in the community that can't be visible or do not want to be visible for any reason. Well, I'll tell you about two people that I really admire and, and look up to. And so one is right behind me. This is Aluk. That's Marsha Johnson next to Aluk. But that is Aluk, who is one of our fiercest and best artists and poets and spoken word creators and fashion leaders um, in our community. And Aluk gets so many death threats and told that they are so ugly because they have body hair and just all these like really horrible things, literally just for being visible. Um, and so I think Luck has so many wonderful um, posts on their Facebook and on their website and poems, you know, about that experience. And I think I would point anybody towards, you know, the healing words of Luck um, in terms of how radical and how revolutionary it is to show up. And also Laverne talks about that as well in our community. So I would definitely take the light and shine Shine it on uh, a luck there. And then the other person would be my auntie Monica. So on Monica Roberts, she and her, she passed away last year, which is, oh, we're still mourning um, her loss. She was known as the trans griot. She held, a griot is someone in a particular African culture or tribe that holds like four to 500 years of the history of that particular group. Wow. And so she was known as our griot, G-R-I-O-T. You can search her. For her, she always talked about being an unapologetic Black trans woman. And so for me, that term of like, don't apologize for it, like that kind of power. And she she was very tall and very much most people, um, I think she would consider herself visible in terms of her trans status. And also she was very loud and open about it. Um, so I think she really inspired me because, I mean, in Texas, she would always show up to every single Texas legislative session. And this is our first one where she's not there. It's really hard because I really miss all of her posts about how terrible and stupid and all these things, you know, the legislators were and how historically they were wrong about all these things and like citing her sources. And ugh, I just I miss that about her. And she just showed up and she was unapologetic and she was visible and she was seen and it cost her way more than it'll ever cost me. And so I take my inspiration from her. I hope that I make her proud. Um, one of the last thing, conversations we had, she was like, we got one at the Mayo Clinic, because that's where I'm doing my residency. So she's like, we got one up there. Oh, we got us a trans guy. I love that. There. And so just trying to think about my trans ancestors and trying to think about, you know, folks who 
who have been there and done that and taking my inspiration and learning their their wisdom is really what I would encourage um, our community to do, especially if we're struggling with the idea of visibility. And sometimes even if you can just be visible to yourself or to your puppy, like if you have a puppy, just kind of like say that you just want to wear um, a little nail polish or whatever it is and just kind of show up. I think that's also a beautiful part of visibility. And I think it's my uh, idea is that it's actually sacred and we've been lied to and told that it's the opposite of sacred. Don't you think it's sacred? Yeah. <laughs> I think all that. pets do. Phoenix, pets, definitely. Pets love us just just as we are. <laughs> yeah. I was so worried when I was transitioning that um, I had a cat named Haley that um, that somehow like she wouldn't like love me or she wouldn't like come to me in the same way, but it was the exact same. So <laughs> I like to think my, uh, my cat tipsy got even closer to me when I transitioned. <laughs> I love it. So I just have kind of one final question, kind of a hopefully fun and lighthearted question. What is one of your like most favorite things about identifying as the gender identities that you hold? One of my most favorite things about identifying with the different genders, or I guess I would just e easily say it being part of the trans community or being trans, is that I get to look for the gifts of being trans in the mix of all of the people that would tell us the curses of being trans. And so whenever I learn about like, oh, we get to choose our own name, that's a gift. Not everybody gets to do that. Right. If I kind of think about those little pieces, I love, I don't know, I love being able to, to think about the gifts. And I think that also comes from queer um, ancestors as well, whether or not they identified as trans, is this idea of we are a people who takes bro broken glass and turns it into stained glass. Things that other people would think were garbage, we make beautiful. Um, and so I don't know, there's just, there's mystery, there's sacredness, there's just a lot of really amazing pieces of being trans and it took me a lot of time <laughs> to believe that. Um, but the more I connect with my elders, the more I'm connected with community, the more I see our kids um, and look at me and they ask me questions and how things light up in their eyes. I don't know, it's just very meaningful work and I'm really grateful to be a part of our gender fam is what I like to call us. Yeah, <laughs> I love when you call it that. <laughs> it's just gender something, whether you got one or not, and then fam, because you're fam, <laughs> you know, simplify. I also love that idea of like taking broken glass and turning it into stained glass. That feels very appropriate. Yeah. Johnny Boucher, um, they pronouns was the person that introduced that idea to me. I'm not sure where they got it from, but I was like, oh, that is just so lovely. And it's really what our queer and trans ancestors have had to do and have shown up and done historically and present day. So in closing, is there anything else that you want to share about yourself or Trans Day of Visibility or really anything else that we haven't yet talked about? So um, I think, goodness gracious, and I feel like Laverne talks about this a lot, Laverne Cox, she, her, about, you know, with visibility, you know, there's expense that comes with that, right? And so I just want to talk all about what she says. Um, but I guess what I want folks to think about when we think about the day of visibility is that a lot of the visibility that we've gained over time hasn't always felt very positive. And a lot of the visibility that I'm seeing on my social media or hearing in different conversations with folks is very much focused on how different ways that we're either not really trans or how to exclude us, especially our sisters, from public life or especially those of us who are most visible from public life. And so I think, you know, it's important to push back against that and to show our sacredness, to show our creativity, to show our powers, to show our gifts, um, especially at least for that one day. And then hopefully people will understand that the whole reason people who are not supportive of us show that other type of visibility is so they're shining the light off of our needs and how we suffer in this world and instead of figuring out how to focus on how different we are. So hopefully we'll focus, you know, on visibility on 
how like amazing our people are and how powerful and creative and beautiful and sacred. But at the same time, hopefully we'll also get people to see we need some support. We need some help. We're actually being murdered and dying. And y'all are having conversations of if we can use the restroom or not. Probably not a great thing. Stop avoiding that, you know. Come and meet us. We're awesome. It's like the bathroom is an important issue, but it's like the low-hanging fruit. Exactly. So I'm asking everybody who's doing one of these videos with me to name one or more organizations that support trans and non-binary people in any way, and asking people who are viewing this video if they have the means to donate time, money, energy. Is there any organization you want to give a shout out to? Sure. Yeah, let's do Gender Infinity. I helped to found that um, over 10 years ago. And they do an annual conference for gender folks of all ages and um, parents and providers, healthcare folks to come together and learn how to take better care of ourselves and each other. Um, and they have an awesome board. It's trans-led. Um, and I'm just super proud of the work that they've done. And when I was stepping off of the board, you know, it's just like leaving my child. Um, yeah. They've really thrived, even in the pandemic. They've they're still having vir a virtual conference coming up. I think September seventeenth and eighteenth of this year. Oh, so wonderful. check them out, genderinfinity.org, and support them however you can. Cool. Is there anywhere that people can find out more about you and the work that you do? So my website is thegenderdoctor.com, and so just search thegenderdoctor.com. Um, and you can always message me through there if you'd like to message me or see the different research that I've been working on or look at whatever there. And I am working on trying to be more into social media. I have a Twitter that I don't really use, but I think I'm supposed to. So if you have any tips for me on how to tweet or, again, trampa, it's just, I don't know, I'm not a millennial. I try. So let, let me know how I can, you know, maybe <laughs> if there's anything I can do visibility-wise that y'all think would be helpful and use yeah. in my privilege as a doctor or a double doctor or whatnot. I love community feedback and input on that and holding me accountable to all my privileged identities as well. I'm here for it. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Colt, for taking the time to do this today. And Thank you, future I... Dr. Chloe. <laughs> future Dr. Chloe. <laughs> One day that, that'll be it's take away the future. It's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Thank you so much for taking the time and I hope everybody enjoyed everything that you had to say. I know I did. I feel like I get to learn some really awesome things from everybody I'm talking to. It feels like a privilege for me to be able to hold this space with you and everyone else. So thank you for yeah. making it happen. Of course. And kind of in closing, be sure to, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. And if you have any comments for me or Colt, or just any reactions, any questions, whatever it may be, uh, put it down in the comment section below. And I'll put links to all of the stuff that Colt mentioned, Gender Doctor and Gender Infinity, also in the description below to make it easy for everyone. All right. Thank you so much. I love you all.